Hello, welcome back to this lecture on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya and I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. So in this lecture, we are going to continue from where we left off in the last lecture, wherein we are discussing optimal reception in additive white Gaussian noise channel. Before we go to our problem of binary signaling, let us just recollect what the tools that we developed in the previous lecture are. In particular, if you consider MRE signaling in an AWGN channel, you have a vector y is si plus n. Remember, how do we get these vectors? We get these vectors by projecting them onto the basis signals and you can just treat your signals as vectors. The effective noise that affects your signaling is that vector obtained by projecting the noise onto your basis signals and we said that because of the theorem of irrelevance, the other part of the noise, the n perpendicular does not affect your detection and so you have this particular relationship where your vector y that is received is si plus n where n is a zero mean Gaussian noise vector with variance or covariance matrix sigma square i meaning component wise the noise is sigma square variance and independent, uncorrelated and independent. Now the ML detection rule that we derived was basically we had to just write the likelihood function which is the Gaussian and we wanted to maximize this. But we said that since the S uh, or the relationship between Y and SI essentially appears only in E power minus, the only part that affects you is the Y minus SI norm square because it's E power minus Y minus SI the norm square if you just substitute in the PDF that you get from this Y is equal to SI plus N. And because you have to maximize e power minus norm y minus si square by choosing uh, over different i's, you just have to minimize norm y minus si square, which is why the ML detection rule just reduces to the minimum distance detection rule. And we also added a simplification. If you want to write it in terms of inner products, you can expand this norm y minus si square. There's a common norm y square term that you can eliminate and put a negative sign. So you have this to be equivalent to arg max norm y minus, sorry, no, inner product y si minus norm si square. This is an, th these two are basically equivalent and you can use either. Sometimes one will be easier than the other. For the minimum probability of error, the only difference is that when you write the likelihood function, the prior probability pi i also comes in, which is why you have this particular extra term coming in and in the expansion also this will be there. If this log pi i is equal for all i, then this arg max is not going to depend on pi i because pi i is something which is not dependent on i. Therefore, this will reduce to the ml. So the ml and minimum probability of error are equivalent and uh, under, under the case of equally likely transmitted symbols. To give you a, an idea as to why this actually matters, suppose that there is a scenario where one symbol has much higher probability. Let's say that the probability of sending 1 is 0.9 and the probability of sending 0 is 0.1. I'll give you a simple exercise. Think about this. The probability of sending 1 is 0.9, which means at the receiver, if you just close your eyes and say always 1 was sent, 1 was sent, 1 was sent, you're going to be right 90% of the time. So in this situation, you can definitely see that doing ML is not optimal and you have, and this MPE, if you actually work it out, will give you a probability of success of a little more than 0.9. So that's an exercise which you can look at. The proof for this we saw in the previous class, so we will not delve into it again. So today let us focus on binary signaling. Binary signaling is something that is uh, like a very basic kind of ingredient. It's, you can think of it as the act of sending bits, but it will also serve as a building block for a higher number of signals. To understand binary signaling and the performance with binary signaling, we will consider the simple case of on-off signaling. In this situation, either you switch on the voltage and you send a signal or you just send nothing. That's These are the two modes. It's almost like you know a zero or a one. That's basically the model with which we are sending. We are going to inspect only one symbol, although you can imagine that this 
symbol, this transmission is going to be repeated again and again and again for every symbol interval capital T as you saw in the pulse shaping related discussion. So, in this case let us take this scenario H1 situation where y is equal to s of t plus n of t that is s of t is sent and y of t is received this y of t is s of t plus n of t. This situation is where let us say this is the situation where you send 1 this is the situation where you send the bit 0 you send nothing y of t is n of t that is if you do not send anything at the receiver you are only measuring the noise. Now we want to use our the knowledge that we have gained by you know we have proved the optimal detection mechanism and we are going to assume that the 1 and 0 are equally likely. So, minimum probability of, er probability of error is the same as the maximum likelihood. So, what we are going to do is we are going to find the optimal detector and when we closed in the last class we guessed that if we look at this inner product y s as a just the number it is by just which we are going to use to make our decision the decision rule essentially becomes is this z more or less than norm s square by 2. This is the guess that we made uh, for good reason because you know in a, this norm y s when there is no noise this inner product y s rather when there is no noise is going to be norm s square when there is no noise and you send 0 then it is going to be 0. So, it is like we are guessing that it is the midpoint ok. So, that is basically what we are getting at and then we will look at the ml error probabilities and so on in this situation after checking whether this is the correct kind of uh, decision region or decision criterion that we have. Before we go into it for every problem till you get comfortable it is a good idea to just match this with our vector picture and what kind of signaling is happening. In this case we have only s of t as our signal of interest. So, this s of t can be anything let us say that s of t is something like you know this particular pulse it is like 0 sorry let me just correct that. So, let us say our s of t is something like between 0 and 1 it is 1. You can take this you can take a sink you can take anything but for simplicity I am taking this. Now, the way I have taken s of t is to say that I have just taken this as my you know the signal if you now want to do something like Gram Schmidt orthonormalization, it is very easy because you only need to do the first step because there is only one signal. So, the S of t is going to be equal to your psi of t. Or if you want to just uh, have some fun, you can, you know, you can, you, you need not take this as 1, you can take this as 10, in which case your S of, you know, psi of t will be, uh, S of t will be psi of t by 10 and so on, ok. So, imagine that there is a signal in the background, there is a, there is a basis in the background this basis is going to be psi of t is equal to s of t by norm s. Obviously, because if you just take s of t and divide it by root of integral s square of t dt, this is psi of t is just s of t scaled to be unit energy. So, that is the picture that you should have. Here we have one dimensional signaling because there is only one s of t. If there were s 1 of t, s 2 of t, and if they were in different dimensions you could have had multiple dimension signaling, but in this case we have one dimensional signaling. Fine, let us actually now just work this out in a rather neat way and find out this decision whether this decision rule is correct and so on. So, let me go to my piece of paper, yep, so I have my piece of paper, ok. Yeah, so now what I am going to do is I am going to work out uh, I am going to work out this particular scenario and see how it pans out. So, let us take the blue color, no let us rather let us take the black color. Let us actually sketch the probability density functions of y under the hypothesis, hypothesis h0 and under, under the hypothesis h1. Under the hypothesis h0, nothing is sent, only noise is received. Under the hypothesis H1, S of t is sent plus noise is added and that is what is received. These are projected onto, uh, well in this case you know if you check what we did, you had this S of, you had just this inner angle bracket y s. So, you are essentially just going to add this, you are just going to take the inner product with s. So, we are going to start with that picture, ok. So, if you send nothing, 
you are going to get something like this. This is basically under the hypothesis H0. If you send, and by the way, this is the uh, probability density function of Z. So, we are going to write this as Fz given dot of Z given dot, where dot is H0 or H1. That is, this is the PDF of Z and this is the PDF of Z under H1. And this particular point is going to be the mean of Z when, say, when H1 is sent. So, let us write those things down. So, Z given H0, that is inner product Y comma 0 is 0. I have to write expectation rather. Okay, let me just take this a little more slowly so that you can get a better idea. So, let me erase this part. Okay. So, now the question is what are the means and variances of these two Gaussians? So, first of all, why are these Gaussian? S because S of t is a known signal. If you take S of t plus N of t and if you then convert them to numbers like you just you you are just doing z is equal to angle bracket y comma s okay so under let's say under h0 okay z is equal to angle bracket y comma this is under h1 of course angle bracket y comma 0 okay which is equal to 0 no but this there is a slight catch this is only in the situation where there is no noise so you have to Okay, this is this is under the case where there is noise so because this is actually S plus. Okay, let me now erase this. This is S plus N, sorry. N comma 0, which is equal to 0. The other thing we are going to do is we are going to say under H1 z is equal to angle bracket y comma s which is equal to inner product s plus n comma s which is equal to inner product n comma s. So, this is the situation that we have okay? that is if we assume that only if nothing is sent we measure the noise if we assume that something is sent we have to measure the we will we'll be measuring s plus n. So, now once we go back, we have these two scenarios and we will, we will find the ML error probabilities by looking at the value of z. But before that, let us first just get some things clear which we have written. z is conditionally Gaussian. Why? Because you are adding a fixed number. So if you take inner product y comma s, y has n of t that is the Gaussian and all others are fixed numbers. So, expectation of z given at 0 is expectation n of s, uh, expectation of angle bracket n comma s which is 0 Ex and variance of z given at 0 is covariance of n s, n s. This is something we have seen earlier, this sigma square norm is square. Expectation of z given h 1 is expectation of s n, s plus n comma s which is norm s square. Similarly, variance of z given h x 1 is covariance of s plus n comma s, s plus n comma s. Again, by using our result that, you know, if you take inner product n v 1 and v 2, you can get this. This is something which we will prove. So, let us first go back and get those results over here. So, just for simplicity, I am just going to write them in a, in a, in a nice way. So, what do we have? Okay. Our definition is z is inner product y comma s. So, this z is a random variable. Why? Because it is dependent on n. So, now let us say expectation of z given h0. What does that mean? Under h0, what is the value of y? y is, this is expectation of, under h0, y is just n of t. So, this is going to be angle bracket n comma s. So, this is not at all surprising because you only measure noise and z has only the noise component overlapped with s. And if you write the integral and take the expectation inside, that is this is going to be expectation of integral, let us say minus infinity infinity or most general case, uh, s of t, n of t, 
dt and if you take the expectation inside this is going to be integral minus infinity to infinity s of t expectation n of t dt this is 0 because expectation n of t is 0 because your noise was 0 mean. I am going to leave this as is, okay, but I am not going to repeat these integrals for the other cases. Now, since we need to find the error probability also, we need to characterize this Gaussian under h0 more carefully. So, the mean as I have drawn is around 0, so this guess was correct. What about the variance? How fat is this Gaussian? For that, we need to find out the variance of z given h0. To do this, remember that we had this result. The result was expectation of inner product n comma v1, inner product n comma v2, where v1 and v2 are any two fixed signals is equal to sigma square times in angle bracket of v1 comma v2. We derived this two lectures ago. This result will come in handy when we do the work below. So, variance of z given h0 is See what is z under uh, hypothesis h0? It is s plus n. Sorry, it is just uh, you know. Sorry, y is just n. So this is expectation of angle bracket n comma s, n comma s. Okay, that is just expectation of n comma s, n comma s. Actually, you can uh, maybe rather than write it as expectation, let me just write it as covariance because it will be easier for us to use this formula. You know that co covariance of x comma x is the variance. So, I am just writing this as covariance angle bracket n comma s angle bracket n comma s is a real signal. So, I can change the order of the covariances. I have this formula here. So, this gives me sigma square times angle bracket s comma s which is equal to sigma square times norm s square. This means that the covariance of this particular Gaussian under hypothesis h0 that is the distribution of z is completely characterized by this. When 0 is sent you have the Gaussian to have mean 0 and it has a variance of sigma square norm s square. So, that is basically the full characterization of the PDF of z under the hypothesis h0 which is another way of saying 0 was sent. Our next task is to repeat this for h1. Okay. So, now under h1 our reference is that y of t is s of t plus n of t. So, our z is equal to okay, I should know z is equal to angle bracket y plus n comma s which is equal to angle bracket sorry it is not y plus n it should be s plus n that I, okay because y is s plus n yeah which is equal to angle bracket s s plus angle bracket n s which is equal to norm s square plus angle bracket n comma s fine what is the expectation of z under the hypothesis h1, you just put your expectation here. Norm s square is a fixed number because s is a deterministic signal. So, this is going to be norm s square plus expectation of angle bracket n comma s. We just proved above that expectation of n comma s over here is 0. So, the same result applies over here. So, this is equal to norm s square. So, the mean of z under the hypothesis h1 is norm s square. For the variance, variance of z given h1, I am just going to use the covariance approach. I will write this as cov angle bracket. Okay. I am just going to write the covariance of z comma z that, that is going to be s plus n comma s comma s plus n comma s. Okay. Just for convenience, if you want to do it directly, there is no problem. But now, I have this formula, the same formula, expectation of n v 1, n v 2, 
sorry, if you write expectation of income V1, NV2, that is covariance of NV1, NV2, I should have uh, written this as covariance. So, I can just address that also. Actually, I can leave it because there is zero mean, so it doesn't matter. This is the same as covariance of NV1, comma NV2, that is sigma square times the angle bracket of V1, V2. So, if you use this particular formula, unfortunately here it is not in the same form because there is an extra S here. But we can always use the linearity of the inner product and this is covariance of, we can write this as inner product S, comma S plus inner product n comma s comma inner product s comma s plus inner product n comma s and as you know this is norm s square norm s square these are fixed numbers for the purposes of covariance we can subtract them out so this is going to be just cov of inner product n comma s comma inner product n comma s which is equal to not surprising sigma square norm s square which is the same as the previous. Therefore, our conclusion over here is that this particular Gaussian under the hypothesis H1 has a mean at norm S square and has the same variance as the other Gaussian. Therefore, by symmetry, you should be able to safely conclude that this particular point is the midpoint between 0 and norm S square, which is norm S square by 2. Okay. So, now when you want to make a decision, how do you decide given y which hypothesis is more likely? It turns out that it is very easy. It is the, you just have to find out which side of norm s square by 2 you are on. If you are on the right side of norm s square by 2, it is more likely that h1 happened. If it is the left, more likely that h0 happened. In other words, if you are closer to norm s square, if z is closer to norm s square, you are better off saying that 1 was sent. If z is closer to, uh, rather if it is closer to 0, that is to the left of norm s square by 2, you are better off saying that 0 was sent. This is the optimal decision for this kind of binary signaling, but and this is where you know our slide comes in. So, we use the fact that the, uh, under, hypothesis, uh, under hypothesis h0, z has 0 mean and z has sigma square norm s square variance. Under hypothesis H1, Z has norm S square as mean and the same thing as variance. Now, we have the recipe for making the correct decision. Now, unfortunately, even with correct decisions, we can make, or rather not with correct decisions, what we think are correct decisions, there can be errors. Why? It could so happen that the noise can essentially, under even under hypothesis H0, let's say 0 was sent, noise can carry you through to the right side of norm S square by 2. In a similar fashion, one was sent and there may be a high negative realization of noise that may carry you to the left of norm S square by 2, meaning that under both these hypotheses, there is a chance that you may end up making an incorrect decision. These incorrect decisions are what we call errors or symbol errors. So, what we want to find out is that under the, you know, in this scenario, what is the probability of making symbol errors? Okay. Let us do that afresh. Let us just move to the next page. So, let us say symbol errors. So, we want to find the symbol error probability. Okay. So, let us now draw the, okay. I will draw with some spacing. Okay. This is under hypothesis H0 and let us now in the other color, this is under hypothesis H1, oops, I do not want it to go to go negative, okay. And this is our decision region. So, this is norm S square, which is the same as mod S, you know, integral S square of T dt. This is mod S square by 2 and this is 0. Now, what is the probability of an error? Let us say under hypothesis H0, okay this is the mean actually, it should come down. Just bear with me, it should actually just come down after this, but yeah. An error happens if you send 0, but you fall into this particular region. Yeah. 
you fall into this particular region. So there is a simple error probability that you can find out by finding the probability that under hits 0, or what is the probability that you cross a square by 2. So let us now evaluate that probability. Okay. So to do that under hits 0, remember what our z parameters are, under hits 0, it is 0 mean and has sigma square norm s square as the variance. Therefore, if you have sigma s square norm s square as the variance, then what you need to do is, you need to do this. Probability of error under hypothesis 0, which I write as PE0, is equal to integral norm s square by 2 to infinity, because I want to find this area, 1 upon variance, root variance is sigma norm s root 2 pi. I am writing the formula of a Gaussian. If you remember, it is 1 by sigma root 2 pi e power minus x square by 2. I am just writing sigma norm s root 2 pi e power minus small z square by 2 sigma square norm s square dz. This is the formula for the error. How I did I write this? Because under the hypothesis is 0, mean is 0, variance is sigma square norm s square. This is the distribution. What is the probability under this distribution that the realized random variable falls above norm s square by 2? Let us now evaluate this. It should not be too difficult okay? because we are good with Gaussians. Uh, we always want the standard normal. To make the stand this the standard normal, I am going to make a substitution. We are going to say let u is equal to and I am choosing this very carefully. It is actually z minus mean of z by root variance, mean of z is 0, so z by sigma norm s. Under this, right, when z is equal to norm s square by 2, the value of u is, so norm s square by 2, so the value of u is going to be so, you just substitute norm s square by 2 here, you will get norm s by 2 sigma. Therefore, let us now evaluate this integral p e given 0 is equal to integral norm s upon 2 sigma to infinity. Infinity does not change because it is just a same, uh, the same sign, it is just a you know scaling by a fixed constant. 1 by and if you look at du is dz upon sigma root s. So, this particular sigma root s will get absorbed into this dz. So, you will get root 2 pi e power minus u square by 2 dz. Now, your eyes should perk up over here. Why? Because this is actually the q function. So, this is the q of norm s upon 2 sigma. So, this q function gives you the probability of having a symbol error when the symbol 0 is sent. You can also say bit error because we have 0 and 1. This is the probability of making an error under hypothesis 0. So, q of norm s by 2 sigma, if you evaluate this, you are going to get the answer. Uh, before we talk about this particular, uh, some intuitions related to this, let us also just look at the probability of error under the hypothesis H1. So now, under hypothesis H1, it's uh, you can, I am not going to go back and show you, but we have seen that the Gaussian which you realize, the, like the distribution of Z under hypothesis H1 has a mean of norm S square and a variance of sigma square norm s square and in this situation you make an error if you go to the left of norm s square by 2. Now, intuitively because of the symmetry you can clearly see that the area over here is equal to the area over here but still for the first time it is a good idea to evaluate it and verify that it is indeed the case. So, I am just going to write it down quickly and we can confirm that it is going to be the same error probability. So, under hypothesis H1, 
we have mean norm s square variance sigma square norm s square. Therefore, our probability of error given 1 is remember we have to be to the left of mod s square by 2. So, it is integral minus infinity to mod square by 2 ok 1 by sigma norm s root 2 pi e power minus we have to be very careful z minus norm s square the whole square by 2 sigma square norm s square sorry yeah dz ok now over here again we will make a similar substitution u is equal to z minus norm s square by sigma norm s d u is equal to d z upon sigma you know norm s that takes care of this part over here and to change the limits when z is equal to norm s square by 2 u is equal to uh, this norm s square by 2 minus norm s square upon sigma root s. So, this will be minus norm s by sigma. Okay. This means my p e 1 p e given 1 is going to be which is going to go down a little the limits okay, the signs do not change nothing changes over here minus infinity to minus norm s by 2 sigma e power minus u square by 2 upon root 2 pi d u. This is equal to and even though the limit is from minus infinity, infinity to minus s by 2 sigma because of the symmetry of the Gaussian it is equivalent to integrating from plus norm s by 2 sigma to infinity this will also be q of norm s upon 2 sigma q of norm s upon 2 sigma. Therefore, the probability of error under the hypothesis h 1 and the probability of error under the hypothesis h 0 are both q of norm s by 2 sigma. And if since these two are equi equiprobable, the overall probability of symbol error or in this case bit error is going to be half of p 0 plus half of 1 which is q of norm s by 2 sigma. Okay. So, this is where we are going to stop for this lecture. The key takeaway is that whenever you have this kind of additive white Gaussian noise channel, the relationships between the noise and the signal, especially in the case of binary signaling, will allow you to make these computations very, very easily and it is essential for you to understand that wherever possible take advantage of the symmetry to find out the error probabilities easier. You do not always have to work this full thing out, sometimes by inspection you may be able to write it, but just be careful. The other thing is whenever you take the metric like z which is angle bracket y comma s to be evaluated, evaluating this particular metric and finding the point where you have to make a decision is key. So, to conclude what we said is that under hypothesis H0 we found the distribution, under hypothesis 1 we found the distribution and wherever our decisions actually at norm s square by 2, the value of z being norm s square by 2, we cannot make a decision either way. Of course, the probability that the noise will exactly take you there is anyway 0. To the left you will conclude 0 percent, to the right you will conclude 1 percent. If the noise is very, very large, then you have to incur symbol errors and this symbol error is given by q of norm s by 2 sigma under the binary signaling approach where it is on off that is a 0 corresponds to 0 being sent and a 1 corresponds to norm s being sent. In the next lecture, we will extend this to the concept of by, you know, binary signaling with two different signals so that you can contrast and compare the 
effective errors and we will also talk about the energy per symbol and energy per bit and those implications on this kind of signaling. Thank you.